what it is. There we go. Um, okay, yeah, I wanted to say hello and uh, welcome to everyone uh, for joining us tonight on the webinar, which is the fundamentals of deep retrofit with Nick Parsons. Um, and we're really lucky to have Nick here this evening to share his wisdom and experience. Uh, it's going to be quite a, an experience, I think. Um, so just some things about the webinar. Um, we're going to go for about an hour and a half to about half seven. We may just inch towards quarter to eight, but there was a strict cut off there. So we won't be, won't be going any longer than that. Um, you are all muted. I'm very sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but there's quite a lot of you on the call today. So we're, we're pushing a hundred people booked. So we'll see how many actually show there's lots of people. Um, so unfortunately we can't unmute everyone and get you all chatting. Uh, that's just the nature of the medium I'm afraid, but we do have the chat, uh, which I can see is already really busy. Uh, so do feel free to use the chat, to say hello to other people, to share where you're from, uh, to ask questions and um and comments during during the webinar um if you have questions for nick do use the q a uh that should be uh one of the the buttons in in the in the tab that you can see on the on the zoom uh kind of toolbar um and yeah we will probably deal with them at the end but nick may also pause uh probably for breath uh, knowing nick um, um to maybe answer some also on the call today, we have Liam. You say hello, Liam. Maybe he's yes, muted. hello everyone. <laughs> I was muted, hello. <laughs> so Liam is Retrofit Manager here at Carbon Corp on our People Powered Retrofit service. Liam's gonna be sweeping the, um, sweeping the chat, maybe answering a few questions, maybe curating the Q&A as well, and just generally helping out, yeah? Yep. <laughs> Good, good. I introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Atkinson. I'm from Carbon Corp. Uh, I project manage the People Powered Retrofit project and I've worked in retrofit for the last 10 years or so. And this is Nick. I think, Nick, we're going to be without your web camera, are we? We're not going to have the pleasure of your face. Have you, have you not got the camera? Well, I can't see it at the moment. Maybe, maybe when we get going, the camera might emerge. Oh, it says, you, it, it says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll unstop it in a second and hopefully right. we'll see you. But if, anyone, if anyone's wondering what Nick looks like, this is Nick. Um, that's, that, that's rather ruined it because I was going <laughs> to say that lock, lockdown has hit me badly and I was going to say that I was clean shaven and bald before. <laughs> before. <laughs> Oh, oh well, your opening <laughs> joke. Uh, we'll introduce Rick and uh, Nick in a second, um, but just very briefly, uh, Carbon Co-op um, and Urbed, uh, we're running a service, People Power Retrofit, it's an end-to-end -end service for householders looking to retrofit their homes. And um, the reason, one of the reasons we've got Nick along, we've worked with Nick for a number of years, but Nick is part of the delivery of the service um, he will very soon be carrying out assessments, my home energy planner assessments in people's homes. Uh, and also he's been training and working with the contractors that we've been working with on this project. Um, so yeah, he's got an immense amount of skills and expertise within Retrofit, um, as well as being a, a Retrofit contractor himself. He's also worked in the assessment side uh, in the past years and also done teaching at the Centre for Alternative Technology amongst other places. Um, so we're really, really uh, lucky to have you on the call today. Um, Nick, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, but also I'm going to stop sharing and allow you to share your screen and maybe we'll see your face as well. Okay. Yeah. Can you see me yet? I don't understand why. You can't see me. No, it says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. I'm very happy for you to show yourself. Um, and whilst you're whilst you're doing your presentation, I'll see if we can somehow un unfreeze your face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah. Okay. It it only means that I I've got a, a a goodie box of all sorts of samples of stuff that I was going to wave across the screen. But if you can't see me. Um, you could see me earlier on, could you not, Jonathan? No, we couldn't see you earlier on either. Oh, right. 
we, we wanted to. Yeah, it's, right. it says the host has stopped it. Right. Hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. 72 participants from all parts of the, uh, the UK and other bits of the globe as well. Welcome, everybody. Uh, delighted to um, see you all. I'm really sorry you can't see me. Well, indeed, I can't see you, but there you go. So that's mm -hmm. all of us in the dark. Um, I'm Nick Parsons, and um, I got into energy efficient refurbishment, as we called it then, um, over 30 years ago when I used to work uh, for an inner city housing association in Sheffield. And um, we were doing up old Victorian terraced houses and they were really difficult to heat and we were letting them to people on the bottom of the income heap and they couldn't afford to heat them. So we started getting into very basic internal insulation and so on and gradually pushing the envelope until we were doing um, very high uh, standard new builds and very high standard refurbs. But we were doing internal insulation with the sort of um, standards that were common in the 1980s. Um, they were neither exciting nor very well detailed. Um, so I think Jonathan was going to go back to sharing my screen, but I'm going to do it for him, I think. Here we are. Um, and somewhere, slideshow, excuse me, did a ring about. Those of you who know me will know that technical stuff is not really um, um, my strong point. Anyway, retrofit fundamentals. Uh, and um, that got changed slightly to deep retrofit fundamentals. I'm going to talk about um, retrofit, which is cohesive, um, which doesn't leave gaps as far as possible around the building. But there are some people who uh, think a really deep retrofit involves uh, ripping the house out from scratch, getting uh, access to every part of the house and being able to see that you're doing it all right. And my experience um, has generally been that most of my clients are not able to move out and do the house all in one hit. They need to do um, it incrementally. But the important thing is to make sure that you are able to join up the dots um, and that you don't end up with one room insulated nicely, another room insulated nicely, and a great fat cold bridge um, in the middle of, uh, of the two. Um, so I've then changed this to deep or eco or thoughtful retrofit fundamentals. When I say thoughtful, I mean well thought through so that those sort of gaps don't exist. When I talk about thermal bridging and so on, I've got a few. Um, explanations uh, on slides later on but if there's anything that you think I don't know what this bloke's talking about um, use the chat and Liam is curating the comments there so what sort of building needs an eco retrofit um, arguably the majority of older buildings um, if we're to meet our 2050 carbon reduction targets uh, I was at the AECB the Association for Environment Conscious Building um, conference uh, last year I think it was and I can't remember the figures but it was basically we're going to have to be doing one deep retrofit every I don't know half an hour a day whatever it might be um, if we're going to meet our 2050 com commitments and it's quite frightening however even much newer houses may need retrofitting some houses I think um, People uh, who have worked in the field probably know that some houses, even built today, may perform so badly that what they really need is an eco retrofit. Um, right, I'm moving on too fast. What I didn't say is that when I left the Housing Association in the year 2000, I uh, went to run a community based um, energy advice uh, project in Sheffield. Uh, based at the city farm and then I stayed there for 10 years. Uh, one year we ran out of money to pay me so I had to go and work uh, for the local council as an energy advice officer. Um, but then in 2010 
I became self-employed and it's now my 10th year of self-employment. As a trainer, as Jonathan said, I teach for the uh, Centre for Alternative Technology, teach their eco referred course there. And I do consultancy, I do surveys and hand holding for people, and I get my hands dirty. I come from Sheffield and um, there's not an enormous number of eco contractors over here. Uh, so quite often people say, who should I use? And or I've tried to find somebody and I can't. And actually I end up doing quite a lot myself. I'm getting a bit old, so I'm trying to get out of this. So this is one of the reasons I've been doing contractor training for Carbon Co-op, because I want other people to get trained so that uh, I don't have to carry on uh, wrecking my body. So we need to decarbonize, reduce heating demand, and we need a nationwide program of deep retrofits. If anyone uh, is as gloomy as I am about uh, the failure of the, the Green Deal program, I'm not sure how positive um, we are going to be able to be about other nationwide programs of retrofit, but it's to be hoped. We really, really need it. Um, so, you can't see me, so you won't notice that I've got great big bags under my eyes, but I just thought I'd take a photo of what I'd been doing today, which is internal insulation on a Victorian terraced house with a 100 mil wood fibre board. And the wall you can see on the left there is uh, a passage wall um, to the, um, the general of the house next door, uh, and the wall ahead is the um, the cellar head, so that's a heat loss wall as well. So I've been I've been getting my hands dirty today. Um, so motives for retrofit. When I started getting into uh, refurbishment, um, energy efficient refurbishment, as we called it then, didn't really know about carbon uh, reduction and so on in the in the eighties. Um, so. <clears throat> Our motives were not about carbon reduction, they were about energy efficiency, but mostly they were about energy efficiency so that our tenants could actually afford to heat the houses which, which we'd given them. And the typical refurbishment of a house in the early 80s meant that you couldn't afford it because you didn't do much to change it away from what it had been like in Victorian times, apart from it not having open fires. So, but obviously energy efficiency is one thing, comfort. And, you know, comfort sometimes says it all because I've seen various debates uh, recently about is external wall insulation worth it? It's gonna take yeah, however long to, to repay. Well, I think if it makes you feel comfortable when you didn't feel comfortable before, it's worth it. You may not be able to afford to do it. That's a bit of a problem. And that's why we need schemes of uh, grant or, or, or decent price loan aid. But comfort is a wonderful thing. Health, um, to a small extent, through lots of lobbying in the 1980s, um, there has been a move to recognize the links between energy efficiency, um, well insulated houses, well heated houses and, and health. But you know, wouldn't it really, really help if you could prescribe central heating, you could prescribe uh, insulation improvements and so on. And I've put increased value with the question mark because quite frankly, I, I'm, I'll never make an estate agent, quite frankly, I don't really care. Um, now, obviously, I can't change whether one can afford it or not, but I'm quite happy to do loads of work on my house, even if the value doesn't increase. I want to make it more comfortable. I want to reduce my carbon impact. I have a confession here that I've lived in this house over 30 years, and I did fairly wide scale internal wall insulation in the late 1980s, and I did it to the standards that were current in the 1980s. Uh, the building regulations didn't require anything. All they said really was you don't have to make it any worse. 
and <clears throat> I fitted it as per the manufacturer's instructions. And basically, we'll come to this a little bit later on, I have thermal bypass and cold bridges aplenty. Um, so I'm now doing my house again. Right, okay. So how much energy goes into space heating in your home? Um, OVO energy estimate about 100 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. Other sources suggest higher still. Um, the Association for Environment Conscious Building, very good organization if, if people haven't heard of it. Their silver standard requires about 40 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. Enerfit, the passive house for, for refurb, as it were, uh, requires about 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. And the full passive house, uh, which is usually new build, but you can get passive house certification of a refurb, um, requires 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. So if we're kicking around over 100 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum, there's a lot of improvement we could make. Okay. Um, drivers. So in a way, there's no right answer to how do I do an eco retrofit. Um, it's up to the person that's going to be most unhappy if you get it wrong, if you don't get, um, if you don't steer the course which you want to steer, is you. So the important person to keep happy is you. So it might be that you want to avoid the use of petrochemicals. So perhaps you want to get away from gas boiler and gas cooking. You may not want to use petrochemicals in your instruments either. However, there is one way of looking at it is that if I use a petrochemical based insulant, which reduces my heating load, reduces the amount of gas that I burn in my gas boiler, then I have made a, as it were, capital use of petrochemicals in order to reduce my revenue use of petrochemicals. Now, there are some people, um, I have certainly been told in the past, hang on, how can you be saying that you're teaching an eco refurbishment course if you are prepared to consider using petrochemical insulins? And it's a valid question. Um, there are times when for various reasons, reasons of space, reasons of structural capacity, when I feel the need to use lightweight insulations. But it's, it's a perfectly reasonable question. Okay, so you might want to avoid hazardous materials. Depends uh, what you call a hazardous material. Um, there are lots around. Lead, for example, is a hazardous material, but it's also fantastic roofing material, and particularly for flashings and so on. Most of us have lead on our roofs. Um, I would prefer not to stop using lead. So there's always a little bit of um, use of hazardous things. Um, obviously, we, if we're doing a refurbishment, one of the first things you want to do is check whether your house has any asbestos in it. And it's astonishing how many houses have asbestos in them. Stuff used right up to the 1990s. I think the advice from the HSE is if it was um, constructed before 2000, you still ought to be a bit circumspect. Um, do we want to use natural materials? Okay, what's a natural material? I haven't got you on my screen, so um, I, I can't take your, your feedback on this, but um, people think of something that's been on the back of a sheep or uh, is perhaps recycled paper or um, wood fiber or whatever. But, you know, glass fiber is a natural material or it's made of natural materials. Um, rock wool is a natural material, but also involves blowing up hillsides. So, you know, it's again, if you are happy to use uh, glass fiber and rock wool, um, don't let me stop you. I don't enjoy working with them, so I generally don't use them. But in the end, if you're happy to use them, then that is a perfectly valid choice for your retrofit. Okay. Use of breathable materials. Uh, I use quite a lot of wood fiber, dense wood fiber insulation. And that can be used in situations without a vapor control layer. We'll come to vapor control layers in a bit. 
but it to me vapor control layers are generally something which can get holes in it subsequent to its installation and can go wrong and if you haven't got a vapor control layer provided you don't need one if you haven't got a vapor control layer you've got a material that's okay to use without a vapor control layer then you can't damage it because it's not there okay uh cost is going to be a driver undoubtedly and that's why most of my clients want to do bits at a time and probably many other drivers as well whose list is right what should the rules be as i said the most important thing is that you're happy with it all you can do is make the best choice uh, based on the information you have at the time find the right people carbon co-op people powered retrofit um, you know there's lots of good advice out there limiting factors for retrofit uh, listed buildings conservation areas national parks areas of outstanding natural beauty planning rules can i just do external wall insulation well maybe you can and maybe you can't sometimes you can and you can't with the same set of circumstances on two different houses and uh, you're told one needs planning permission and one doesn't but that's just one of my little beefs um building regulations do you need building regulations to insulate your house yes generally you do um does everybody get building regulations approval mm, quite often not um and i get quite a lot of people who are annoyed with me when i say my costs include 150 quid for doing works to um renovate a thermal element and the um when the building reg says renovate uh the building act defines renovation of a thermal element as adding or replacing a layer so basically if you slap some insulation on a wall like you saw in that picture earlier on um, then you are renovating a thermal element so provided it's more than a certain percentage of the wall you have to get building regs approval and if i bring in the old cynic in me it is worth getting it because if you come to sell your house and it, they ask you in the searches have any has any work that's been done in the last few years and you say yes and they say does it have building regulations approval um and you say no i didn't know it needed it and then they they want you to get they want you to buy a one-off uh, premium indemnity insurance so that the new purchaser doesn't get stung by it but I'm an old cynic because I think quite often, along with this, I need an indemn indemnity insurance comes, I'd also like you to knock five grand off the price. Um, so that may not always happen, but if you can avoid that potential um, request for a drop in price by engaging with building control in the first place, not a difficult um, thing to do, then um, it is worth doing it. Um, <clears throat> neighbours, does the Party Wall Act apply? Party Wall Act certainly applies to the uh, the job I'm doing at the moment, and so I have to get the uh, client to serve a notice on their neighbour, which is fine if the neighbour says, "Yeah, of course, you didn't need to ask," and they say, "Well, yes, actually, I have to ask, and I have to do it in writing. I don't want to be over formal, but I have to do it to comply with the law." If your neighbours don't like the idea, then um, you have to appoint surveyors and you as the applicant have to pay for both party surveyors if i remember correctly there is if you google the party you search i'm not advertising for anyone if you search for the party wall act there's a very good government guide to it uh, what your uh, what the circumstances are when you need approval and what your obligations are do you need to get permission from your freeholder to do major works now for a lot of people, this won't apply. You've got the freehold of the property anyway. But where I live in Sheffield, huge tranches of Sheffield are leasehold. It may be a 999 year lease from 1800 and something, but it's still strictly um, leasehold. So you may, somewhere deep hidden in the lease, may have been obligation to um, get the leaseholder, the freeholder's approval. Do you need to inform your insurance company or lender? 
I had no idea that I had to inform my insurance company until I changed insurance companies. And oh, yes, I do. Quick bit of retrospective there. Um, practical and technical things. Are you able to do what you would like to do? Can you put 200 mil of external insulation on your front wall when it will make your house look very strange compared with the semi next door? Well, yeah, you can. Um, your own wishes as well, and that includes aesthetics, of course. Um, so set your retrofit, your retrofit project brief. Um, I've got a link there to the People Powered Retrofit <coughs> program of the Carbon Co-op. What you want to do, what you think you can afford to do, and what you want to get out of your, your retrofit. It's your shopping list. And shopping lists normally start off with a huge number of things on them. And then you start to price up that shopping list. And huge numbers of things fall off again. Um, because you know you'll probably find a lot of things that you can't afford but um, the more you insulate the more you get airtight the smaller is the heating system you're going to need um, so it's not cheap none of this is cheap I'm sad to say but uh, it can be done so find your baseline get a survey to find out the existing energy performance of the building because if you don't know if you don't measure you can't monitor so if you don't know where you're starting off, you don't know how far you've got to go to improve to a certain standard. So again, Carbon Co-op's My Home Energy Planner uh, <clears throat> will give you a good baseline and scenarios for potential sets of works that you might do. This is one that frequently people don't pick up on. Make good disrepair. It sounds blindingly obvious, but don't box in any dodgy bits behind any insulation. Don't let good works lock in decay. Um, plan any alterations that you want to make to internal space or extensions that you might do and adopt a fabric first approach. Um, you want to assess fabric first being deal with, as I say, the air tightness, the insulation, and then everything else becomes quite easy. As I say, you've got a smaller boiler if you've, uh, if you've just insulated to a, to a great extent. Assess and address the air leakage. Plan your air tightness layer. Where is the air tightness layer going to be? If you've ripped the house out completely and you're going to do it from scratch, it's an awful lot easier <coughs> to know where your air tightness layer is. I went to view um, a, an attic conversion a while back and they were doing stuff to make it airtight in the attic, but it wasn't clear how that was going to tie in to any other airtightness layer when it got further down the building. And I had to say, well, you know, you need to think about how it's going to connect up because you're planning future works. Where will it be? What will it be? Uh, it doesn't have to be a membrane, it could be um, plaster. Plaster or render is a very good air tightness layer. Design in your insulation. Watch out for thermal bridges, poor detailing, and get it to look right. Um, one of my, I have the Nick Parsons cardinal rule of insulating round windows. So for example, if you're insulating internally, when people say internal wall insulation, they don't mean insulating internal walls, they mean insulating internally the external walls. So when you come to windows, you want to return the insulation into the reveals. You don't want to have a, a thermal bridge through the edge of the window, um, but generally you can't go round the reveal with the same thickness, so you have to thin it down. And my cardinal rule for insulating round window reveals is the end result must not look stupid. If you come round and basically you've lost all the frame and you can only see the glass, to me, that would look stupid. And I'm no aesthete. Um, so don't make it look daft. Concentrate on getting these bits right and the bolt-on goodies can come later. I am not being disparaging there. I love um, renewable technologies. I particularly like solar water heating. It's a bit sad that it's still the poor relation because... Uh, PV got so cheap as a result of feed-in tariffs and so on that 
solar water heating seems quite expensive in comparison and a lot of people will actually use PV, photovoltaic, solar electricity uh, and an immersion heater rather than a uh, solar water heating system which I love because uh, I failed physics at school and it's my level of physics. I can understand the physics of a solar panel and I can generally understand building physics as well. So it just goes to prove when you get something you're interested in, you can learn. So ideally move out. I don't mean move out and leave your house and go to another house, but move out during the refurbishment. So many of us don't have the luxury of doing that. Lots of people say don't do it one room at a time, but most people have to. So do your air tightness, insulation and ventilation plans first, and then do the increments. Know where your joints are going to be and how you're going to pick it up. If you're doing internal insulation, for example, take the insulation on the ground floor up into the ceiling void so that when you do the room above, you just got to lift up a floorboard, pick it up and whoopee, away you go. If at all possible, avoid doing stuff twice. So for example, um, if you are going to, if you are planning to do a whole house retrofit in bits, maybe don't get that all singing, all dancing, fancy kitchen that you really crave until you've insulated the kitchen. Put in some pretty basic secondhand stuff or whatever, and then you won't feel upset at whipping it out when you have to insulate the kitchen, okay? So um, there's no typical retrofit. So all of the houses I'm gonna show you might have an eco renovation. Uh, we could think about how we might insulate them, uh, whether the planners would like it and whether we, if we owned that house, would like it. So um, are we gonna externally insulate that one? Uh, there's a photo I keep meaning to take. There's a, uh, in Alfreton in Derbyshire, there's a terrace of Georgian houses and one of them has been externally insulated and it has brick slips. Yeah, it looks brickish, but um, it looks very different from the ones either side. Uh, so I wouldn't be externally insulating that front elevation, but I might be ins insulating the side and the back. So that's one possibility. This one, um, you can probably see, it's got a bit of an oversail on the roof. So it looks like you could probably get a hundred mil of external insulation on there on, to give you a bit of an indication, the, uh, the U value requirement, the insulation requirement for um, refurbishment of walls, uh, it, it, of solid walls is 0.3. Uh, watts per meter squared K, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, and <clears throat> on a solid wall, which that isn't, I'll explain what that is in a moment. On a solid wall, you can get the solid nine inch brick wall, 225 mil brick wall. You can get uh, about, get 0 0.3 with about 90 or 100 mil of uh, graphite expanded polystyrene. This house actually is steel. Um, and steel framed brick clad uh, on the uh, gables and the rest is just sort of infill but you do find with a lot of 1960s 1970s houses that they're built even if they're not steel framed they're built on the spine wall uh, on the flank wall principle so uh, the if it's a detached house the two side walls may be load bearing and everything between them is is infill uh, there's usually great big beams between them and then basically built in the 60s and 70s, poorly filled holes uh, around, around all the rest of it. So you can get massive, massive air tightness issues. Um, what about this one? Are we going to externally insulate this one? <coughs> this uh, was one that I was called to have a look at because the um, people that were doing it up did not know that they had any obligation to insulate when they ripped it out and it was completely ripped out and they were doing, they were replacing layers as defined by the Building Act, they were adding or replacing a layer. So they had an obligation 
to meet the requirements set down in uh, the approved document L1B for refurbishment of houses um, in, in the building regulations. If you go on uh, planningportal.gov.uk, um, it's got everything there you need to know about planning and building regulations and you can download all the approved documents which are basically they're not the building regs themselves but they are ways of meeting the requirements of the building regs they're very very useful they often have get out clauses so for example they will say if your house is built of um, materials which were designed to be water vapor permeable which old houses generally were lime mortar lime plaster and so on then if using modern materials and making it not water vapor permeable might do damage to the building fabric you don't necessarily have to meet the stringent u value requirement for refurbishment when i say stringent it isn't half as stringent as uh, enerfit for example but it feels fairly stringent to some people uh, this is another one. How would we externally, ins how would we insulate that? Well, if it were me, <clears throat> uh, happens to be, if I remember correctly, uh, in a national park, very unlikely get permission to insulate over the stonework. And anyway, the owner bought it because it's a lovely stone cottage. However, you could well consider externally insulating the, the gable wall, which is already rendered. and. I don't know about planning in national parks, it may be different, but generally, as long as you don't change the appearance of a building, you can, you have permitted development rights, so you don't have to apply for planning permission. You have permitted development rights to externally insulate. So that one, for example, certainly if it weren't in a national park, you could insulate that, provided that it looked the same afterwards. You do have to be a little bit careful and I might recommend that you actually um, have a pay you know, 85 quid or whatever for a pre-planning um, assessment with your planners because some of them can say if you insulated that with 100 mil of insulation and you didn't extend the roof line then you'd have to put some uh, industry standard capping detail which are often quite I don't think they're perfect, put it that way. Um, interesting bits of little roofette so that you make the, you, you give the external insulation its own roof. And the planners could actually say, well, I think that makes it look different. Therefore, it does need planning permission. So I've had situations where I've been absolutely sure that it does require planning permission. So I've told my client to apply and they've had their money sent back. And the planners have said you don't need planning permission and on that basis i told the next client that they didn't need planning permission but we rang up just to be on the safe side and the same planning office said yes you do so who can tell it's always worth checking um and this one as well they bought it because it was a lovely stone cottage they're not going to be externally insulating sometimes you 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 have to know when you're beat Okay, regulatory frameworks. If you don't go for something like Enerfit, the, the building regulations still cover a lot of what you want to do. As I say, approved document L1B. Generally, if you're doing more than 50% of a thermal element, or you are doing retrofit renovation works to more than 25% of the building fabric, so if you add up the square meterage of your floors, your walls, your roof, um, and you're doing work to more than 25% of them, then all of that work has got to be done to comply with the energy bit of the building regulations, okay? The important thing, if you're internally insulating external walls, the 50% changes. When you're look, looking externally, it's the elevation, or as I say, if you're doing more than 25% of the building fabric, it's of the whole house. But if you're insulating a room, it's more, if you're doing more than 50% of the room you're standing in. So if that has got um, a couple of external walls and you're insulating them both, then you are doing 
you're renovating more than 50 percent therefore you have to apply for building regs many many people don't realize that the work they're doing is notifiable work as i said before uh, and there's a useful link when do i need building regulations approval okay uh eu value um, <clears throat> i apologize if i'm preaching to the converted um, hopefully there's some of you out there that don't know what a new value is because then I can explain it. Um, when, I, when I'm teaching on new values, sometimes this is a whole afternoon. And the important thing is that new values are fun. Once you know, it's the amount of heat lost in watts through a square meter of anything, any part of the building fabric, when it's a degree colder on the outside. Um, you've got a single glazed timber window, the U value is about four. If you have a window which is one square meter, you're using four watts. You're losing four watts of heat through that square meter of window when it's one degree colder outside, but it's 20 degrees colder outside. So you're losing four times 20. 80 watts and in one hour's time you have had to put 80 watt hours of heat in to make up for the heat that's going out through that window there's probably more going out through uh, leaks around the side of the window where it hasn't been very well fitted but you can't mix up u values you don't get a worse u value because you've got air leakage you get worse thermal performance of the house I'm just giving you four things for a new window, 1.6. Uh, good triple glazed, passive ish sort of window, 0.75, something like that. Uh, for many, many years, um, oldies like me have been able to trot out 2.1 for a solid nine inch brick wall. Um, and then the not least um, based on quite a lot of um, research. My internet connection is unstable, apparently. That's worrying. OK, um, based on quite a lot of research, um, the government SAP, if you haven't come across SAP, it's the Standard Assessment Procedure for the Energy Rating of Buildings. The SAP now assumes that it is 1.7. OK. Um, so here are your targets. I'm not going to dwell on those, but different targets for different bits of your, your building. Um, and a fit or passive house, typically you're looking for U values down in the 0.1 somethings, uh, 0.1 to 0.15. If you've got a loft and you haven't got a room in the roof, um, then I regard lofts as something you just fill with a lot of cheap stuff. You know, if you don't mind using uh, glass fibre, for example, if you're going to use a, a natural material which sort of costs a king's ransom, you may think twice. But if you don't mind using something cheap, then to me, four or five hundred mil is not too much. And that will get you down to 0 0.0 something, 0 0.08, something like that. Um, <clears throat> and if you can do it, you can do it, but bear in mind that roofs always come to a point somewhere um, at the apex, um, pitch roofs, at, at the, uh, the eaves rather. So you're not gonna get 500 mil of insulation at the eaves. So plan it, what can you do? You're gonna go down to more or less nothing. So can you maybe insulate with a higher standard insulant right down in the eaves and then go up to the cheap stuff as you, as you move up? Um, so how would you achieve building new values? When might it damage your building fabric? Um, external wall insulation, I've already said about 90 or 100 mil would get you that on, would get you a compliant new value on a uh, 225 brick wall. Um, 150 will get you down to about 0 0.19. It's that magic 0 0.1 something. External wall insulation is probably the best thing Provided it's detailed correctly, I haven't put in any of the horror stories uh, this time, but if you look around on the net, there are examples of appalling um, detailing of external wall insulation, which will guarantee that water gets between the insulation and the house in time. But 
If it's done right, external wall insulation keeps the building fabric warm and snug in a lovely warm overcoat. Um, there's no real limit to external wall insulation depth. Um, <coughs> you need some pretty long fixings, but uh, a scheme that I was involved with a couple of years ago, we did 200 mil on two walls of this detached house and then insulated internally with 100 mil of uh, wood fiber on the other two walls. Uh, the reason for not doing external insulation on one of the walls was because the client would not consider changing the frontage of the house. And on the other wall, the wall was only 20, uh, 200 mil, sorry, eight inches away from the adjacent house. So unless you had a very, very thin renderer, you were never going to get in there with any, uh, with any external insulation. Lots of possibilities. Expanded polystyrene is quite rare among plastic insulants in that it does have a degree of breathability. When energy geeks say breathable, they don't mean about air getting through uh, buildings. I was pulled up once when I was doing some training which was funded by a national park and uh, I sent a possible schedule for the training and it was run past one of their architects and the architect said, He's talking about air tightness in refurbishment. You can't have air tightness in refurbishment of old buildings because old buildings have got to breathe. So he was thinking breathability means leaking air. It doesn't. It's when when geeks say it, it's about water vapor permeability. Okay. Um, so here's your at the bottom of the page here. Here's your get out clause. Um, if you've got buildings of traditional construction with permeable fabric, um, you may not have to meet the full building regs uh, requirement, but you do have to make sure that your building control officer will accept that. Okay, external insulation. This building didn't require planning permission, though I had to pay for a pay and wait a long time for a pre-planning um, opinion before we knew for certain. So basically it looks very, very similar. Um, we did replace the windows at the same time. Um, achieving low U values with internal wall insulation, uh, probably a lot of you have heard of interstitial condensation. Every wall, for example, has a dew point. If you've got an old solid brick wall, the dew point, the point at which water vapour turns into liquid, is probably just about on the outside of the brickwork. Might be an inch or so in, but anything condensing out there will basically find its way out without damage. Sometimes a little bit of frost damage to the mortar or even the brickwork if the brickwork's soft, but nothing much. If you warm up the room, you must be cooling down the wall. So what you do is you draw the dew point in to the point where the dew point may be on the old surface of the wall behind your insulation and into that wall are built your joist ends, your timber lintels above your windows and so on and you're putting all of those in an aggressive environment. So you do have to be very careful about it. Condensation risk analyses are available for most insulation providers for free. They're based on the Glazer method, which is a fairly blunt instrument. Um, there are other ones. Uh, Woofy is one of them. It stands for something in German. I think I may have a slide that tells you what it actually stands for in German, although I probably can't pronounce it. But uh, <clears throat> you do have to pay for those and there's not many woofy practitioners uh, around certainly not in my neck of the woods okay so if you're going to insulate the, the picture on the left is um an impermeable insulin it's pir polyisocyanur at kingspan Celatex, that sort of thing um the all of the joints are taped with air and vapor type tape as a vapor control layer. So basically you're using the foil uh, as the vapor control layer. So do make sure when it's got lots of dings in it, when it's, uh, you've hit it with things or dropped a bit of wood on it, make sure that you repair those. 
If you are going to use a vapor control method of insulation, then you have to treat it as basically a risk management exercise in my view, and just go over and over and over it again. How am I limiting the risk of interstitial condensation? Am I limiting it enough? On the right, you've got permeable wood fiber, and that's the sort of stuff that I've been fitting today. It's very, very dense, and it buffers moisture, and it basically, the, the particular stuff I've used in the past, although I gather it's uh, stopped being made or certainly not imported into the UK anymore, it's called Pavadentro, <coughs> and it had an extra little layer in it, and it was fairly cunning. It wasn't a vapor control layer, but um, it works so that if there is ever a serious overload of moisture within the wood fiber, which does any, in any case tend to buffer um, the, uh, the, the moisture, if there's a serious overload, then it actually allows interstitial condensation to occur within the wood fiber board from whence it can then breathe back out um, when humidity drops into the room again, rather than occurring in that danger zone uh, where your joist ends and purlin ends and whatever else may be hidden. So I think that's quite clever. But uh, the recommended um, thickness for, from, the, from the suppliers was that you didn't go above 100 mil with Pavadentro and on a 225 solid brick wall that would give you about 0.35 which is not the 0.30 that the building regulations would like but um, I, I've i never had a problem with it. Um, I did explain in detail to a building control officer when he came to visit um, one of my jobs what Pavadentro did and so on uh, why we use wood fibre insulation and he said coming to your jobs Nick it's like doing CPD and I was really chuffed and then I thought a couple of years later I thought some people hate doing CPD so never mind right okay um, so both external wall insulation and internal wall insulation need building regs approval unless you're only doing a tiny bit other approvals may be required for listed buildings and so on um, certainly I've never list lived lived in a listed building uh, sorry i'm running these teeth in for someone else i've never lived in a listed building but i gather it's not always easy um okay nick, well, I, nick. i've already told you that uh, nick yep just to give you a shout as i said i would that it's seven o'clock just coming up to seven o'clock jolly um, good and also you might you could try your camera now i've fiddled okay. with the settings it may or may yeah. not work uh I've lost the um, the widget. <laughs> I've lost the the bar, which gives me the option to use my camera. I can see I've broken your flow now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm... <laughs> Maybe we'll do without your face for now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm. I'm really. I'm really sorry that you can. You can't see my we'll face. We'll try it you're after really you stop lucky. presenting. You're really lucky that I can't. <laughs> Jonathan's always show, already showed you at the beginning what I look like, so why should you want to see any more? Okay, so um, vapor control layers are used to um, stop water vapor getting through. So basically, the standard Glazer method uh, condensation risk analysis will tell you that if you do not have a vapor control layer, there may be a risk of you getting interstitial condensation. Oh, look, there's me. Okay. Um, now, now you can probably see me because I can certainly see me. Um, yes, we can see you. Okay. <laughs> well, you I, have grown yeah, hair. You're I, even. I do apologise. Um, and it, while, even though he said he would, you have actually grown more hair. I think. <laughs> I, I have. Yeah. Just, just as a little aside, when I've been in various video conferences um, um, during the lockdown. Um, I've been very impressed with the sort of libraries that people have had behind them. They've got all this sort of energy books behind them and whatever. And I have a load of fridge magnets, but I don't know, not sure what that says about me. Um, but basically, when you do a conversation risk assessment um, and you say it doesn't have a vapor control layer, they will say, right, there is a conversation 
an interstitial condensation risk. And then they tick the box to say it does have a vapor control layer. So they say, if you put a vapor control layer in, you won't have a condensation risk. But there is no box that I know of that you can tick to say, yes, I've got one, but it's a bit rubbish because it was tight enough when I first installed it, but I've had a few other trades that have come along and put their holes in and, and weren't aware how important this layer was. So they didn't tape it back up again. So this is why I like using materials which do not involve a vapor control layer, because if you haven't got one, you don't damage it, okay? Um, as I said, I like using uh, breathable wood fiber or cork. Um, and I am just unable to move this along. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I can tell you what uh, what WUFI is. It's an acronym for Warmer und Feuchter in, in Stationar, uh, Heat and Moisture tran Transiency. There you are. We now um, we now know a lot, don't we? Um, okay. Consider intelligent membranes. It, Generally, your vapor control layer is a sheet of plastic or a sheet of foil. There are intelligent membranes, um, su excuse me, such as you can't see a lot there. Some of you may recognise this green. This is Proclima's Intello uh, membrane. I'm, they don't pay me to flaunt their stuff, but it's quite uh, it's quite clever stuff. But basically, it most of the time it is vapor tight, so it acts as a vapor control layer. But um, in warmer weather, it becomes slightly vapor open. So if there has been a buildup of moisture, um, then it can actually breathe back out again and uh, dissipate that moisture from the building fabric. Okay. Um, can you use, um, if you're doing a, a room in the roof particularly, if you've got a wide open loft, then you can put whatever you like in there. But if you've got rooms in the roof, uh, I don't know if this is the case where, where you all live, but um, in Sheffield, an awful lot of the terraced houses were built in the 1890s or whatever with attic rooms already. They're not loft conversions. They always had attic rooms. Um, and they were built with the sort of timber <coughs> which was used then, which in terms of longevity is a lot better than we could get from a timber merchant, but they weren't really chunky sizes. 3x2, 75 by 50 um, rafters. So if you were to say, right, I only want to use uh, really green insulants, I want to use rigid wood fiber insulation, you'd actually have to get a structural engineer in to say, will my roof take this, this load? And I had a situation where the client wanted PV, photovoltaics, on one of her roof slopes. And she also wanted to use wood fibre. And basically, the structural engineer said, well, you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. So they ended up using PIR, uh, which basically gets you a lot of performance for a relatively small thickness. It's still a lot for some people um, to meet the building regs requirement of 0.18 on a sloping ceiling. You need five inches, 125 mil of PIR. Um, and you've, got to, you've still got to ensure very good ventilation behind that so you don't get any condensation because as I said, your vapor control layer is never going to be perfect. Um, by all means, consider natural materials, but this is one situation where I do quite end up using PIR. I hate working with it. It is not fun to use. Um, it, um, it does something to me nasal passages. I really don't like it at all. Um, you may still require a vapor control layer with natural materials. It's not necessarily a passport to not having to use a vapor control layer. Uh, certainly one of the uh, manufacturers of sheep's wool insulation always used to specify a, um, a vapor control layer and I'm fairly sure they still do. Okay, so if you had rafters and your structural engineer and said, yeah, you should be all right adding a bit of weight to this. What if you've got 75 mil deep rafters, you need a bit of a ventilation gap above, and you want 250 mil of insulation to uh, <coughs> meet the building regs. You can use something like um, 
an eye beam uh, you subject to structural assessment you could use your own or you could buy somebody else's i don't know if you can see that that is a prefabricated i beam so that would kind of go underneath your uh, your rafters if they could take the load and basically give you a load of space to put your insulation in and you can even use if you have a slightly non-standard building you could use those uh, what they call i beams because in section they look like a letter i um, you could use the i beams on the outside of a building uh, that was developed by a bloke in Canada called Mr. Larson, and it's known as the Larson Truss. So basically, they took a standard Canadian timber frame building, then they put these I-beams outside of it, filled it with a load of insulation, and again, you've cocooned your building in a nice, safe, warm environment, and whoopee. Okay, so ground floors, if you're doing a move out, and rip out, retrofit, um, <coughs> dig up the floors. This one... Um, this is some of you, if you've been involved with the AECB and particularly their carbon, ret carbon light retrofit uh, training, may have heard of Tina Holt. Um, this was her old house in Nottingham with 300 mil of insulation, of graphite expanded polystyrene insulation, basically has a better lambda value, uh, lower thermal conductivity uh, than the old white bodily expanded polystyrene. If you have to retain suspended timber floors, Great care is required. Unfortunately, underfloor insulation doesn't always seem to obey, to obey the rules of building physics. Um, this is my house uh, on the left. I, I've just been uh, finally waterproofing my cellar. Whoopee, lockdown, it was wonderful. Um, and I've put 180 mil of flexible wood fiber um, in there. This is. This is flexible wood fibre, um, as opposed to the, rig the rigid stuff. Um, I've also used, because somebody actually paid me for some consultancy in a load of sheets of 150 mil PIR, I've also used that in other places. Uh, the other one isn't mine. This was from a client's house uh, and basically shows you what happens when it goes wrong. You may see a little sort of sparkliness on that picture. Uh, those are droplets of water and it was raining on me underneath that floor uh, and that was because the there was no vapor control layer so when you do insulation of a suspended timber floor from underneath so you've got a cellar for example you think whoopee this is easy I can just slap some insulation up here um, <clears throat> You're not putting a vapor control layer on the warm side of the insulation. The vapor control layer always goes on the room side, so just under the floorboards. You're not lifting the floorboards, you're not gonna have a vapor control layer. So you compensate for that by having excellent cross ventilation. Howling gales, as I would put it. Howling gales are good, as long as they're on the cold side of the insulation and kept on the cold side of the insulation, there's no way for them to get round through to the warm side of the insulation. Um, don't forget thermal bridging. Thermal bridges are weak points. Uh, corners, openings where the windows are fitted, um, intrusive elements which have poor thermal performance, uh, where soil pipes come in, this sort of thing. Um, lots of people say, oh, I did this to remove the thermal bridge. You don't ever, well, rarely remove thermal bridges in my view. You mitigate them, you reduce the, the effect of them, you cloak them but you hard, hardly ever get rid of them completely. Um, the internal wall insulation job I showed you a picture of at the beginning. Um, I, I'm insulating a passage wall. <coughs> so the passage is, a, is an external space, although it's sheltered, it's still an external space. Um, so I'm insulating that, but I'm also taking it round the corner because that helps to reduce the thermal bridge at the corner of the room. Um, it's very briefly covered in approved document L1B. So basically they, they make reference to approved accredited construction details, which you can find uh, online um, from the, the government's accredited construction details. So there's basically a way of um, getting more brownie points. So if you're doing a new build, for example, and you're 
thermal performance of your building is uh, assessed on SAP, on a SAP assessment rather than on elemental U values as it is for retrofit. Um, if you are using accredited construction details, they will um, give you a better SAP score. Um, if you don't enter a value, then uh, default values are used. Right, uh, thermal bypass. <coughs> Some people say thermal bridging or thermal bypass, almost suggesting they're the same thing. They're not, in my view. Uh, thermal bridging is a weak point in the insulation layer. Thermal bypass is where cold air, ventilation air at external temperatures, finds its way to the warm side of the sandwich. So a really common example, in rooms in the roof, you've got some insulation in the eaves of the building, in the triangles at the corners, um, but possibly not a lot of in insulation. And the cold air that's in there, howling gale, is good because it can uh, scavenge away any water vapor before it can condense out. But that cold air can blow underneath the floor of the attic bedroom, cooling the floor and cooling down the ceiling of the room below. Another common example, dot and dab plasterboard. Um, it's where you, you fit a plasterboard. Dot and dab should not be used now. There's a thing which I suppose you could call modified dot and dab, which involves putting adhesive all the way around the perimeter of boards and then blobs in the middle. But even one of the major manufacturers websites of insulated plasterboard still shows adhesive dabs. Do you think if you've got some air movement behind that, it's thermally decoupling your old wall, which was not very good thermally, but it has some thermal um, benefit. Um, if you've got air moving between the two, you're thermally decoupling those elements. Just like I've got in my house, which I did to 1980 standards. So that's why I'm starting to do it again in wood fiber. Okay, air tightness. The important thing is that there's no target uh, for building regulations. Again, they suggest accredited construction details, which may help the air types a bit. Um, but for new build, the target is uh, 10 air changes per hour, which is about 10 times 12, 10 times worse than benefit and 12 times worse than uh, passive house. You can use membranes or plaster layers. I use a lot of lime plaster to seal the masonry. Um, and if you've got an old house with lime plaster, don't strip the plaster off, use that as the air tightness layer. When you take the skirting boards off, you'll find there's no plaster behind it, so you have to sort of augment your, your layer there, but uh, no reason to take it off. But back in the old days, when people were so paranoid, I couldn't possibly lose two inches, 50 mil, off my, off my living room. Um, so everybody, including me, used to strip off the um, the lime plaster so that we buy back three quarters of an inch, um, 18 mil. And of course, then we'd actually made the air tightness situation worse. So um, I, I tell when I get it wrong. I don't always get things right. I've done plenty of things wrong in the past. Any penetrations uh, seal with tapes or sealant? Um, <clears throat> again, I'm not advertising for. Uh, Proclaimer, but I just happen to use a lot of their uh, products. Um, on the left there, this little piece of EPDM rubber roofing, like uh, butyl pond liner, um, with some air tightness tape around the outside, and that's um, a grommet for pulling cables through. You put grommets around pipes. Um, I did have some electricians try and save money for my client by putting more than one cable through the same grommet. If you can imagine the, the typical flat, flattish twin and earth, uh, uh, live neutral and earth cable that you use, you put two or three of those through one hole and there will be gaps around. So one grommet, one cable, okay? Uh, but there's various other things. Uh, you've got a paper-based tape, you've got cloth-based tapes, um, and you've also got a little Third along from the left on the top row is a little smidge of green butyl tape and that's rather splendid. If you're trying to tape up the joist ends, because typically where joist ends go into walls, there's air leakage around there. Even solid walls often leak air. Um, 
if Beatrix Potter can have mice trotting up staircases inside walls, then we can have air leaking through them. Um, and that butyl tape is quite expensive, but rather wonderful. You can sort of mold it like chewing gum around the end of the joist, rather splendid. Um, and if you need to use gunge, um, a lot of people will use silicon or uh, acrylic sealant for everything. And I think different gunges have different places. So Orcon F is a specific air tightness gunge. And there's there, at the bottom there, there's Intello, the intelligent membrane. Here's uh, <coughs> some of the cloth-based tapes going round onto the parge coat. So basically, you can see that I've redone some of the um, lime plaster as a parge coat. That's where the old covings used to be underneath the joists and where the skirting boards were above the joists. So when we took down the ceilings, took off the skirting boards, there was bare brickwork. So down at the bottom, you can see the pattern of the old Victorian wallpaper, if you want to be excited by that. Um, a, is the old lime plaster, which will do perfectly satisfactorily, thank you very much, as a parge coat, and then the, the, it's infilled above that. Um, and there's intelli, Intello membrane through a fisheye lens. Um, some of you may know uh, Gervais Manguano, he's an uh, energy consultant, he's done a couple of very high standard refurbs, one of which is um, NFIT or may even be full passive house uh, certified, I must ask him. Uh, but this, this is his first uh, um, retrofit, which um, he, he sort of um, used me as a consultant on it. Um, air tightness, this is a blower door. So basically you pressurize or depressurize the house um, and that will give you <coughs> a score in a meter cube per meter squared per hour or air changes per hour. Um, and if you depressurize the house, then you can go around the house and often with the back of your hand, if you slightly dampen the back of your hand or you can get a smoke stick, uh, don't burn the house down while you're doing it, um, you can feel the cold air blowing in onto your hand and you can uh, deal with how to do it. Um, now, I've never used this stuff, but I have been recommended and indeed somebody's given me this to show you. Uh, this is blower proof um, and it's a paint on air tightness membrane and when you paint it on it looks like a rubber sheet um, and that can be quite a good get out of jail free card when you have difficult corners and so on to deal with. Um, okay. I'll admit a lot of things. I am not an expert on mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. The point is that when you get to really high standards of air tightness, you probably need mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Because back in the early 80s, when I was in uh, working in housing associations, we had condensation and mold growth uh, and poor air quality. Fast forward to the 2020s, and do a very tight refurbishment without taking into account your ventilation and you may well have mold growth and air quality problems as well so relying on air just to come in and go out is very rarely successful um, do your sums mechanical ventilation is very very intrusive um, it can there can be an awful you can simplify it a bit but there can be an awful lot of duct runs and so on and particularly if you're like me and believe that using rigid steel ducting is better than this sort of flexi plastic ducting which can build up uh, condensation within it and actually grow mold within the ducting um, then it's quite a lot of work so it might be that you could have a sort of smaller mechanical ventilation system and I generally don't like them particularly trickle vents perhaps um, on a few chosen windows to provide the in for the air uh, and then the um, mechanical extract ventilation provides the out so particularly where you're doing it incrementally over a long period that may be the way a way to go I'm not saying what is definitely right and what is definitely wrong. You can get um, single room heat recovery ventilation systems. Um, they can be quite noisy. Some are reasonably quiet, but they do have their limits. 
um, then you have to get the heat in. Um, because the better you do with insulation and air tightness and so on, the smaller your boiler's got to be. So <clears throat> we're all being told that for new builds, um, you may well have to not be allowed to replace your gas boiler. Um, I had an inquiry the other day. Um, my solid walled uh, stone built house, uh, I'm looking at getting a heat pump. Um, and I sort of replied and said, well, yeah, you haven't told me about the insulation you've put in. So if that means that there isn't a lot, then air source heat pump and stone built house may not go too well together. When you consider that uh, most, as far as I know, somebody actually told me of a larger one, but most heat pumps on single phase electricity, which most of us have in our houses, not many of us have three phase, uh, that's normally industrial units. Single phase electricity um, normally gives you a limit of about 14 kilowatts on heat. Um, bear that in mind, that's got to do the space heating and the, um, the domestic hot water. So you need to make sure that your house will run on 14 kilowatts. And are you sure that your energy model is accurate? Um, because a lot of people when they're doing presentations like this one here will talk about the performance gap so for example you do a sap assessment sap the standard assessment procedure for energy rating of buildings does have some shortcomings um, and it can often mean that your building does not perform as the model said it was going to perform and if the model said, oh yeah, we can just scrape through with a 14 kilowatt heat source. Great, I'll buy an air source heat pump. And then you find that you, the model was wrong, then you've got a bit of a problem coming up because you haven't got a boiler big enough. So what do you do? Do you get three phase electricity and a bigger heat pump? The other issue with heat pumps, of course, is uh, how good a coefficient of performance kilowatt hours of heat out of the system for each kilowatt hour of electricity in to run the heat pump. Um, lots of people will talk about a kilowatt, uh, a COP, coefficient of performance of four. Um, that's pretty well best case scenario. Some get to a little above four, I think, but four is a really good COP. Lots of heat pumps uh, get lower than that. They are getting better. And it's getting to the point where air source heat pumps are performing almost as well as ground source heat pumps. And if you can avoid uh, the situation that I had, for example, when I project managed some works for a client and they had to pay 11,000 quid for their boreholes, that made uh, the installation quite expensive. Um, and of course, would underfloor heating be required? You probably know with heat pumps that the COP gets better, the flatter is the heat curve. So basically, if you're bringing heat in, say, from under the ground at about eight degrees, and you're going to run underfloor heating at 30 degrees, because that will give you your comfortable 21 degrees round your torso where you want it, then um, the ramp is quite flat. So you get a good coefficient of performance. But if you're running radiators, particularly if you've left your old radiators in, which were used to receiving water at 60 to 80 degrees from your gas boiler, A, it's not going to be very excitingly hot. And B, you're probably going to have to run that uh, heat pump at about 50 degrees. Not many go above about 50, 55 degrees. And the COP will come down. So it won't be as good. Nick, um, Nick yeah. just to say we're... we're, we're coming up on half seven with uh, okay so yeah and there's lots of questions so right okay i don't have many slides left so, right <laughs> once you've decided on the scope of your plans get your specifier designer develop your specification produce the drawings you need get the necessary approvals if you need them find a contractor with detailed experience of all the materials and methods you want to use that's often the difficult one that's not to degrade it to that Sorry, I'm running these teeth in, as I said. That's not to denigrate any contractors, but some of them will just not have used the materials that you would like them to use. So um, 
I don't know if Liam might say a little bit about this, but I think part of the work Liam's doing involves toolbox talks, talking to builders and um, talking them through the methods before they go off and use them. And one of the best contractors that I worked with, um, we still talk to each other, so it must have been quite a good relationship. One of the best contractors I worked with, I was the um, insulation and air tightness bloke on the job, and he was doing the general contracting, and he's an electrician as well. Um, he, every day, he would say, right, Nick, I'm gonna do this. Will this interfere with your air tightness layer? If so, what can we do to get around it? And he was really, really good. He knew what he didn't know, so he asked questions about it. And that's, the, that's a really important thing. Um, how to get it done? Procurement routes, main contractor. You pay the contractor, the contractor brings in all the subcontractors, and you pay a premium on those subcontractors for the con main contractor to manage them. Um, you could get a project manager who buys in the individual subcontractors, so you're not paying extra for the subcontractors, but you are paying a project manager, or the project manager could be you. You could do some of the work yourself, but if you're doing that in addition to a main contract, check the insurance position. Are you actually covered for working on that site? Some contractors don't want you working on their site when, when, when you're there when they're there rather. Um, some will say, yeah, all right, you can come along, but check what the insurance position is. You don't want to have an accident and then find you weren't covered. Um, type of contract, there are model contracts, there are uh, quite uh, detailed, important contracts. I generally do an exchange of letters or emails. I say, this does include da 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 da, this doesn't include da 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 da. The bits I need you to do are this, the bits I will do are that. That can be enough. Don't forget CDM, the construction, it's not Cadbury's Dairy Milk, the construction design and management um, um, regulations. It's about health and safety. Um, and they, it's very interesting to read because it actually tells you that even as a householder, you may have an obligation under those uh, rules. So, Generally, what happens is you as householder foist off the, um, the health and safety responsibility to the main contractor, but it doesn't always happen. Okay, where can you find out more? For general knowledge, maybe go to the Association for Environment Conscious Building, uh, talk to the Carbon Co-op, um, maybe sign up for an AECB's Carbon Light, Light Retrofit course. Uh, I was involved in piloting that, and it's a really good course. Uh, head scrambling uh, building physics, but um, it, it really is good for projects specific needs. Go out, look at Carbon Co-op's webinars, they're doing one next week on um, heat pumps. Um, and you know, contact them about contractors and consultants and the People Powered Retrofit project. And I've finished, so I'm open for questions. <laughs> well done, Nick. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, you're not going yet, are you? <laughs> no, 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 no. All right then. And are you available for fridge magnets as well? If anyone has anyone they want to. Do yeah, that. yeah. Um, you can't have these, but you know we can. Uh... <laughs>